We're going to move into a question and answer session. We have 50 minutes, 5 0. We'll try to take as many questions as we can. We have two new members of the panel. You heard briefly from Ambassador Elena Poptodorova earlier this morning on the issue of Kosovo. Uh, she is the ambassador of Bulgaria to the United States of America. She's in her second tour as ambassador. We've worked together uh, very closely in the past. I have great admiration for her. She was previously among the many positions she's held. She was ambassador at large for the Black Sea region for Bulgaria. That's obviously a critical part of the world. She also served in parliament. She's been involved in politics as well as foreign policy. And just to my right, uh, Fyodor Lukyanov, who will speak tomorrow morning, but we're very pleased to have him participate in this panel. He is a journalist and analyst based in Moscow. He's editor-in-chief of the Russian journal Russia in Global Affairs. He's also chairman of the Council on Foreign and Defense Policy, which is an, a Russian NGO. He's a graduate of Moscow State University, and we're really pleased he's here to give us a um, ground truth perspective about Russian foreign policy. So um, I think we should open this up right now to questions. And we have a questioner right here. Please just identify yourself. Thank uh, you. Daniel Dibner, Rockport, Maine. Dr. Zhang, extraordinary in every regard. My question is this. With Russia having a GDP just under Italy, right. and the most powerful thing that Italy could do to change the world would be go bankrupt, we see that Russia has been able to leverage itself well beyond its actual GDP numbers. Perhaps the Europeans should give them arms. Perhaps they shouldn't. Perhaps the Americans should give them arms. Perhaps they shouldn't. Perhaps the uh, recipients will take the arms. Perhaps they won't. But if they do or don't, if we do or don't, if the Europeans do or don't, they remain so astonishingly corrupt. The chances are that they could do anything with arms or anything with the funds provided by the Western nations is even more remote. Mm -hmm. My question is a simple one. Right. The Ukraines wanted to join because it was a European Union, what should the Europeans be doing? <laughs> that was directed okay. to you, right. President Jean, yes. Well, I... Oh, okay, well, no? I thought he... Uh, okay. Why don't you, why don't you start, <laughs> right. and then yeah. maybe Fyodor, you Well, can... well you, you, you need to understand, China had a wonderful relationship with Ukraine. Uh, we had a huge investment before Maidan. Uh, then suddenly <laughs> we have a problem. We worry if Yanukovych, you know, the, the success of Yanukovych is going to honor those deals. But they seem to say, well, we, we can still honor the deal. Ch I don't think China had a problem with Ukraine at all, whether it goes to uh, EU or that. That's not the issue. I think the Chinese really worried is that Maidan can may repeat in China in the future for domestic reasons. So this is where Chinese cannot accept uh, to legitimate, legitimate this kind of overthrow of a regime, no matter how you justify it. So that's the point I'm making, yeah. Can I just follow up, Professor, sure, because sure, sure. Um, uh, I know that it's, right. a, it's been a tenet of Chinese foreign policy right. that China does not wish to see one state interfere in the internal yeah. affairs of another, but Russia's just done that with Crimea. So how, the Chinese leadership actually abstained in a key vote of the Security Council to right. condemn Russia. Right. It didn't veto that. Why was that? It, it would not, as I said, this is no longer the moment of a British doctrine. Chinese do not calculate that way anymore. The reason is very simple. As far as the Crimean history, Chinese knew that, Khrushchev and, you know, given and so on. Um, it, it's, it has been Russian, I mean, no matter what, historically. But I think the key issue here from the Chinese point of view is that they have to weigh this veto uh, on the Crimean case, which Russia do have a legitimate reason. It, that's what President Xi Jinping, you know, telephone call, say, we understand there is a reason for doing this. Um, at the same time, they do not you see, the dilemma is they do not want this kind of behavior expand to other area. Crimea is considered a unique case. An exception. Exception, yes. It's Fyodor, exception. do you have a comment? Yes. Thank you. Fyodor. No, as, as for the question, so it's not up to me to decide what Europeans should do. It's not, uh, I don't know. Uh, what uh, makes me a little bit troublesome following today's discussion and uh, many other discussions, 
I can subscribe to a lot of criticism vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russian policy, and of course there are some of uh, facts which are undeniable, a violation of many international principles and so. But uh, what lacks is any kind of reflection on the other side. Was it uh, everything right with the European Union policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? Was it everything right with the American policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, with uh, those marvelous visits by some politicians to Maidan to encourage anti-government riots in the country with the formerly legitimate democratically elected uh, president? Uh, I don't see any critical reassessment on the, or, or very little of that. Uh, as for Ukraine, I'm afraid, uh, sorry to say that, but Ukraine, which uh, uh, emerges from our passionate and very uh, interesting and important discussion, simply does not exist and will never exist. That's the problem for European policy, for Russian policy, for American policy. Let me just draw you out on that. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand. Ru Ukraine does not exist. What do you mean by that? I mean Ukraine, which I here from this discussion does not exist. Ukraine, which has a good chance to become something else, not as we uh, saw Ukraine since the independence. Does anybody else want to jump in here, or should we go to the next question? You go. You go. We have a very good line of... I'll follow you. Okay, great. Well, well, Elena. Happy okay, ambassador. thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm wondering, if I had come here 10 or 12 years ago, and I asked you the question, what do you uh, know about my country? You heard from Nick that I'm a repetitive offender here, so that's why I'm taking you 12 years back. Um, my guess is that, uh, and that's proven in practice, that you would tell me, well, Bulgaria, well, that's the most fateful satellite of the Soviet Union. Yeah, there was the attempt on John Paul II's life and the Bulgarian umbrella. Now, I do hope, and I also know for a fact from other town halls uh, <laughs> previously, that already even America, which is farther away from our own neighborhood, knows that Bulgaria happily became a member of both NATO and the European Union. Therefore, tonight, I cannot argue strongly enough the importance of uh, these memberships. These were life saviors for a country that had poor reputation, very, very dire uh, living standards, and very murky international image. Now, um, I understand that we are talking of Ukraine, which is uh, all ills in the world. Probably that's also true. Can you please tell me what is the kind of mentality that has existed in Ukraine for that long time? I can tell you, because the eels which my country is fighting now with, and thanks to the EU membership again, and, and, and the rule of law concept that finally, finally uh, started being discussed in the country, uh, we are beginning to emerge from a, from a rather gray zone where rule of law doesn't matter, you say corruption. Let's talk corruption, I agree. Let's talk corruption in the whole previous Soviet zone, and we will know exactly how it all happened. So when we are throwing stones, uh, let's just look around and uh, look at ourselves. I'm ready to look at my own country in a very honest and very critical manner. But please, give Ukraine a chance. Thank you. Yes, uh, right up here in the balcony, and then we'll go to remote question. Uh, my name is Ursa Beckford. I'm from College of the Atlantic. Uh, Ambassador Pfeiffer briefly touched on the Russian perspective when he mentioned how they thought the CIA had ousted Yanukovych. Uh, but my understanding is that there's strong evidence that the Orange Revolution was partially funded by Western governments, including the State, State Department. Uh, but whether that's true or not, to me it seems pretty easy to see how the Russian perspective would develop. Uh, that it's the American version or the Western version of little green men that are sort of popping up everywhere. And so my question is, to what degree should US foreign policy uh, be shaped by understanding the Russian perspective? Well, since Steve was ambassador to Ukraine before these events, I think he should answer. But Fyodor, you should also maybe, chime, if you care to, uh, chime in after Steve. Uh, let me respond on the Orange Revolution, because I, I was actually a, a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State responsible for Russia and Ukraine 2003 to 2004. 
Um, and I remember a conversation I had with John Herbst, who was our ambassador on the ground at the time in 2003, and Carlos Pasqual, who had been the ambassador after me and before John, and he was now the assistance coordinator for the post-Soviet space. And so we said, we want to devote a certain amount of money to supporting the election in 2004. Uh, in the end, I think we invested about $18 million. It went to things like training the electoral commissions, training journalists how to cover elections. And it was a program that we were pretty confident we could explain to everybody, including the Ukrainian government, this is a nonpartisan effort to try to pro lead to a free and fair election. Now, we also at one point asked ourselves, should we lean one direction or the other? And you know, it's not a secret. In 2003, had you taken a poll among US government officials, Viktor Yushchenko was usually preferred to Viktor Yanukovych. They were the two candidates who ran in 2004. And we had a discussion. We said we should not do that for two reasons. Uh, the first reason was the right reason. The second reason was the practical reason. But they both came to the same answer. The first reason was, this isn't our election. You know, we ought to use our assistance if we're about democracy promotion. The point is to help the Ukrainians create the conditions where there can be a free and fair election where Ukrainians get to choose their next president. The second point, though, was uh, we figured we're not that smart enough about Ukrainian politics to tell whether <coughs> an American lean towards one candidate, whether that would hurt or not. Uh, we then, so I think we did a pretty good job of staying neutral and working on helping the institutions perform so that they could deliver a good election process. Uh, interestingly, Vladimir Putin chose a different course. He visited Kiev in October of 2004, about a week or two before the first round of elections, and then he came back a couple of weeks later before the second round in which were barely disguised campaign visits on the part of Yanukovych. And I think there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that that actually hurt Yanukovych, that people resented the idea that Putin was coming in saying, vote for this guy. And I think the Russians learned their lesson in the presidential election in 2010. They kept very much hands off. Thank you, Steve. Fyodor. Yeah, uh, Russia is a country where any kind of conspiracy theories are flourishing. This is, we. We can compete with the Arab world in this. And that, that's why I, I confirm that many people in Russia, including on the very high level, believe that Orange Revolution and Maidan last year were organized by CIA. I don't be, uh, belong to that part of uh, Russian society. And I think, of course, that uh, all uh, movements there had domestic roots. But uh, Looking at this situation, 2004 and 2014, from the point of view of structural international structures of international system, I would say projection of power is projection of power. Uh, countries project what they have. Russia has little green men. Russia projected them. European Union and United States have very powerful leverage in terms of soft power. And it was projected, and it's, it's undeniable. And that was enough to bring Ukraine to the situation which uh, it uh, is now. Constanza, you have to I would like to respond to that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, God, there are so many things I'd like to respond to, but I'll, I'll restrict myself. Um, one, Fyodor, there is actually a great deal of literature, both in the media and in think tank publications and in academic publications, about the mistakes made by the West. Um, and a great deal of introspection. It's simply not true to say that we don't talk about this. Um, and the other reality is that the Eastern neighborhood policy as the EU's policy for the in-between states and the arc between Belarus and the Caucasus was called, and later, then later on the Eastern Partnership, was based on the, very carefully based on the acknowledgement of legitimate Russian strategic interests in the neighborhood. <coughs> Which is why, although NATO and EU membership were never explicitly excluded, they were implicitly excluded. That was an unspoken understanding. So all of the, the entire arrangement was directed at an accommodation of European and Russian interests. Um, and very few people in my country, until this conflict in Ukraine, would have ever been willing to countenance the thought of a Ukrainian membership in anything. Uh, that has changed because of the conflict. In many ways, uh, Russian government actions in the last year have changed 
Europeans and Germans' attitudes in this respect. They've clarified how people feel about these things. Um, there is another point that I'd like to make uh, to, to Lin Chen Xiang, if I, if I might. Um, and that is, you know, I, I get the sense that the, the phrase anti-Russian sentimentalism was directed at me. Um, I would like to clarify here that I think Russia is a very great country. And I would like to live in, in peace with it. I would like Europe to live in peace with it. And I have Russian friends. Um, and whenever I go to Moscow, which isn't very often, but I think, you know, what an enormous richness and wealth and capital, and human capital in particular, this country has. So I would like to think otherwise. And like Kolya, I think that this, you know, Russia doesn't, I mean, or maybe unlike Kolya, I think that Russia doesn't have the leaders it deserves. Um, finally, you were asking about a, you know, a strategic paradigm. Um, and I agree that a great deal of time and error is wasted on, on inventing new strategic paradigms. But here's one that I think is useful and that I think actually helps us you know, bring this debate forward. And that is, and it's oddly one that was invented uh, by two people who apparently worked for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, a couple years back. They, they said we should think of a strategic ecosystem between not just the US and Europe, but one that includes China. Interestingly, they said they didn't include Russia. It was a strategic triangular eco ecosystem, meaning, and this is a really important insight, that we are so deeply integrated with each other, economically and politically, that we need to take great each other's needs and interests and values into greater regard because we can no longer assume that we can do whatever we want within the system. It has an impact on the other side. Yeah. That, I think, is a truly useful way of framing how we need to move things forwards. And I personally like, would like to have the Russians in the system rather than out of it. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that exchange. Um, are we going to go, Jim, to a um, question from a remote site? It's up. Thank you. <laughs> David Terry from Belfast. What are the implications of the current crisis in Greece? <laughs> on Germany's response to the Ukrainian crisis. Yeah, I'm guessing that that's one goes to me, right? Or does anybody else want to do this? Please. Yes. <laughs> OK. Uh, I don't want to hog the airwaves here. So, so very briefly, obviously, there is a connection. I mean, right now, Germans are sitting on the fulcrum of three you know, questions that could blow Europe apart. One is the east-west divide on, over Ukraine. One is the north-south divide over how to square um, structural reforms um, with growth policies. And the third one is how much integration is necessary for Europe to, uh, to, to, to survive, which is the, the debate we have with Britain and, and a looming Brexit. Um, now, I personally uh, think you know, the Greeks have unfortunately recently been helping our finance minister uh, be very intransigent on the issue of structural reforms. But I know for a fact that not just many Germans, but many German diplomats believe we need to do both. We need to make sure people stay on track for structural reforms. And I mean, to the uh, people from other countries I've talked to here, particularly the Balts, but, but others as well, even, even the Spanish and the Italians have come out and said, actually, you don't get to do this. You don't get to opt out of structural reforms. But we probably, there is more agreement that you'd think on that we also need growth policies to deal with issues like youth unemployment and, and so on. I'll leave it at that. And these things are connected. Of course they are. And uh, I know David's question has disappeared, but it's a good question because it also has implications for NATO. Uh, the new Greek government is, by anyone's definition, quite radical, the most radical left government in Europe. Some of the members of that government have had very close associations in the past with the Russian government and with Russia. So from the very beginning of this government, they kind of picked a fight with Germany on economic reform, and they picked a fight with the United States on the question of should NATO be in the business, should the EU be in the business of further sanctions. And I just wonder about the political utility of a new government, very inexperienced, going after both Germany and the United States. The consequences are Greece has isolated itself. China, too, with uh, the, tr the, the port deal. <laughs> you yes. did, in the port of Piraeus. <laughs> so now they've alienated China, the United Great. States, the and Germany. Alienate um, everybody. <laughs> a rookie government. And one would hope the Greeks would just pick their fights singularly, not yeah. cumulatively. Uh, OK, we have a question right back here. Hello, I'm Don Cameron from Newcastle, Maine. Uh, at the break, I took the opportunity to call my former Russian business partner uh, to ask him a practical question uh, 
from a person who, who is Russian, who has a PhD in Russian history, just what is, for such a bright person as uh, Putin is, what, what is his end game on this Crimean situation? And he thought that he made a mistake by going and taking Crimea for whatever reason, thought it was part of Russia and always was, etc. But now the issue with the Ukraine is that Crimea without a land line to Russia, it, Crimea is useless to Russia. It's nothing but a tourist attraction other than the sub base at Sevastopol. Uh, and uh, he thinks that that's the objective to get a land line corridor by utilizing a piece of the Ukraine. And I'm wondering if uh, that makes any sense to you all. So maybe I could ask Fyodor, I mean, a lot of people in the West have feared that the pro-Moscow separatists aided by the Russian government will continue towards Mariupol and continue down the peninsula to connect Crimea to eastern Ukraine. Do you think that's what uh, President Putin's intention is? It's very difficult to say because uh, the logic uh, uh, now presented, uh, of course, exists. And uh, Crimea is in a very difficult position, being uh, connected to Russia through only um, strait, sea. which we see, yeah. uh, which is uh, very unstable. And uh, uh, since uh, takeover of Crimea, there are a lot of problems for people there because of that, and for people who want to come, who want to go to Crimea, even even tourists. Uh, at the same time, I think that uh, for now it doesn't seem to likely that this is a goal because, of course, costs will be very big in terms of uh, uh, relationship with the West, new sanctions, and so on. I think the only option to implement this would be if Ukraine will go into another round of domestic turmoil another Maidan, another something chaos. And that will create a lot of temptations, of course. If not, uh, I'm not sure that it's uh, applicable. Thank you. Steve. Yeah, yeah. No, I tend to, I don't totally rule out the scenario of the Russians taking a land bridge to uh, the top of Crimea, but I think it's a fairly low probability uh, because it's about 200 miles. It's not just taking Mariupol. And there actually may be a logic for taking Mariupol by itself because that's the outlet for uh, some of the steel products coming from Donetsk and Luhansk, although I hope the Russians don't try it because that would be a usually bloody fight. But that's 200 miles, and it's not just taking it, it's then securing it. And that's going to be not a separate, that, that will be a Russian military operation probably with air power and the whole nine yards. At that point, I mean, there's no one in Europe who's not going to see this as what it is. Uh, I also think the Russians worry about that if they take it, securing that will be difficult. When I was in Kyiv uh, in mid-January, there was a lot of talk about plans already being laid for partisan warfare if the Russians came much further west. Uh, now, one element of a settlement could be, if they could get to a settlement, would be that the Ukrainians, and I think it would be hard, the politics would be hard, but a settlement might have an, of a land bridge where Ukraine would permit rail and truck traffic between Russia proper and Crimea. The hard part would be designing it in a way that did not prejudice the Ukrainian position, that it was somehow conceding Crimea to Russia. I mean, the, the Ukrainians for, now are focused on eastern Ukraine, which is the right focus for them. They basically said Crimea is an issue for the longer term. Frankly, um, it's very hard for me to see how Ukraine in the short or medium term ever musters leverage to get Crimea back. Uh, and I suspect we're in for a long period where Crimea is in its current status, which only Russia accepts it as part of Russia, and there will be non-recognition policies. But if you could get to a settlement, it might be possible to, in fact, work out an arrangement for those sorts of connections. But it would require, I think, that Russia actually won a settlement on the other terms. Very quick follow-up. Um, does anybody in the panel believe that Russian troops are not in Ukraine? Because for the past year, the Russian government has been denying that Russian forces are in Ukraine. I mean, Steve, just starting with you, is there any doubt about this? There, there's been no doubt that there's been Russian forces. I mean, regular army units going back to at least August. Uh, and at, at least Russian advisors, Russian uh, military intelligence people since April. 
And the Russian army, of course, is in, in Crimea. Of course, the Russian military was already in Crimea under agreement with the, the Ukrainians, yeah. uh, but not under agreement that allowed them to uh, take over Crimea. Right. Yes, I have a question from the balcony. Yes, uh, I'm Alan Schechter. I am a professor, a retired professor of political science from Wellesley College. Uh, and my question is, uh, we're all focused right now on what's going on in the Ukraine because it's absolutely in the forefront of our minds and our concerns. But diplomacy is not a zero-sum game and I want to ask the panel something about what might be possible six months from now, a year from now. Uh, the State Department and the German Foreign Service as well must obviously be focusing not just on this crisis, but on Ukraine, Russia, Western European and American relationships at that point. And I'm wondering whether, the, uh, since uh, Putin has kind of backed himself into a corner here, uh, whether there's any way that he can be encouraged to save face, any policies that can be adopted or pushed for that would uh, encourage him to declare victory and pull out. Professor Schechter, thank you um, for a great question and a great opening for this panel. We've gone from analyzing the problem to proposing how to push back, but is there a possibility, I just asked the panelists, that Chancellor Merkel, who I think would have to lead this, and President Obama could somehow convince President Putin that there's an exit door, as you say, for him, that his troops would leave, and some kind of political arrangement for autonomy for the ethnic Russian community in eastern Ukraine would be arranged and formalized, but the sovereignty of Ukraine would be intact in eastern Ukraine. That seems to be the crude outlines of a deal. It seems to me that Chancellor Merkel and President Obama would want this to happen, yeah. But, that's, but Putin's that, that was made, resistant. That, but that was agreed 10 days ago. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. That was, that's 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 been so? discussing for a year now. That, yep. They've we'll been discussing that for a year now. And uh, I mean, one offer after the other has been made. And uh, by Merkel, most significantly, um, she referred again to, to a um, Russian project that was dead on arrival in 2008, which is this whole idea of a you know, Eurasian economic union from, from Vladivostok to Lisbon. Um, at the time, the reason why it was rejected by the Germans um, was, was that it very clearly implied, um, you know, basically the disappearance of NATO from the Eurasian continent and with it the Americans, and that was a no-go. That was a, you know, deal, deal breaker. But, um, I mean, NATO is, uh, you know, slightly more self-confident now than it was then. That, that can't be the point here. But you could still try and, and, and organize some kind of a trade-free zone. And, um, but I'm, 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 I'm personally, given what has happened to the second Minsk agreement, which the recent is clearly not a agreement. ceasefire, yes, is, uh, you know, is, is enough to make me feel very pessimistic about, about anybody taking these offers up. So, Fyodor, this raises the obvious question. As you, you know, I know you're not in the Russian government, you're just observing them. Why wouldn't President Putin understand the tremendous cost to breaking his relationship with Germany especially, but also the U.S., and take this exit door at some point? Why isn't he doing that? Uh, I don't think, first of all, I don't think that to save face is only Putin's problem. Uh, in this crisis, everybody is risking to lose face, including President Obama, including Chancellor Merkel, including all politicians in Kyiv. And it should be a negotiated solution about collective face saving, I agree. Uh, as for as for, your, uh, as for uh, Putin's uh, um, uh, calculation, uh, I don't believe that uh, what happened a year ago in Crimea was uh, something a pre-planned development. Of course, the Putin's move into Crimea. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, uh, Moscow was deeply shocked by what happened in Kiev, by regime change, however we call it, revolution. Uh, and uh, it was a feeling that uh, Russia had to respond in a way, had to save face, actually. And of course, it was another, another calculation which uh, might be uh, bad and awful, but I, I wouldn't call it irrational, that uh, in case of stabilization of new government in Kiev, and this government was utterly anti-Russian, that was obvious, uh, 
the uh, 2010 agreement about, uh, about uh, extending of stay of Russian Black Sea Fleet in Crimea uh, for 25 years will be denounced because that agreement was signed by Yanukovych. And then Russia would face uh, the situation that Black Sea Fleet should leave Crimea in two years, 2017, according to the initial agreement, which for many reasons was absolutely unacceptable for Russian side. And that was the main motivation. Unfortunately, uh, he decided to explain it publicly by different arguments, taking this national romanticism, Russian world ID, which was, to me, much bigger problem than... This is than President Putin, Putin in front of the Russian speech, Duma. Speech for the Federal Assembly. Yeah. Uh, since that, uh, it was, as President Obama rightly put it recently, it was an improvisation without clear master plan. And uh, in a way, yes, uh, Constance, you're right that uh, one proposal after another was put on the, on, the, on the table. But the proposal which was signed in Minsk when it was proposed in April about federalization, about change of statehood in Ukraine, was dismissed immediately as impossible because it will violate Ukrainian uh, Ukraine sovereignty and so on. Uh, finally, we arrived to that. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, everybody was too uh, late to react, starting from Russia and then everybody. So now we are in the situation where so many mistakes were made, uh, and crimes maybe even, that it's very difficult to find a way out. I don't believe that Putin really wants to uh, destroy Ukraine, disregarding the West completely. But in case of escalation, in case of uh, further uh, deterioration of situation, it might be un ungovernable, unguided. Thank you, Fyodor. Uh, Steve, quick final word on this. Yeah, no, I think if you look at what the Ukrainian government has said, you can see the pieces of a solution that I would argue could be face-saving for everybody. They've talked about decentralization between Kyiv and Donetsk and Luhansk. I think it'll be a hard question to work out how much. I mean, I think the Ukrainian government will insist national decisions on foreign policy, defense policy remain in Kyiv. I'm not sure if that's acceptable to the separatists or the Russians, but that's to be determined. They've talked about status for Russian language, uh, a second demand. Uh, there's already a, a, a Ukraine EU Russia channel set up to talk about and say, as Ukraine draws closer to the European Union, how do you ensure that it does not damage Russian-Ukraine economic relations? And, the, and the, the big elephant in the room is NATO. And I think it's pretty clear uh, that well, President Hollande 10 days ago said he's not going to support Ukraine and NATO. Uh, the German foreign minister said that. Uh, there's no enthusiasm within NATO for the last five years to bring Ukraine onto a membership track. The Obama administration has never talked about it. Now, I don't know how you codify that. But I think there are pieces there that if President Putin wanted a settlement, you could put together to allow him to say, I've met certain key Russian concerns. Uh, I think the difficulty actually would be is that Poroshenko may have time, a hard time selling some of those to his own public back home. But the problem is a lot of those elements were already, I think, in Minsk two, 10 days ago. And it looks like the Russians and the separatists just blew right through the ceasefire. You know, the, it's such a good question that we could have an entire course at my university or anyone else's on this. But at the risk of extending, because I want to get to a lot of questions, the problem, Steve, and I know we've, we've had to debate this, all of us, is if NATO concedes to Russia yeah. that Ukraine will never be a member. Yeah. We are deciding the fate of the Ukrainian people over their heads. I don't think Ukraine will come into NATO for the next 30 years, but for us to legislate it or promise yeah. the Russians seems to me but, but, not right. But, but, but no, I, I agree. I, I, think, I, think, I don't think Poroshenko is prepared to say never. Mm -hmm. But if President Poroshenko were to come out and say, look, we've got a lot of problems. We're going to push NATO down the road 20 years, lead at that, I think then the U.S. government could say, look, we're not going to force uh, Ukraine into NATO. We respect that policy decision. And that might be part of the solution here. I mean, the interesting thing about Ukraine is if you look at the relationship between NATO and Ukraine, the one thing that's changed in the last five years, where I would argue in the last five years, there's not been enthusiasm for putting Ukraine on a membership course to NATO. And that gives Ukraine the idea they can make a virtue out of necessity. I mean, if Ukraine really wants to get into NATO, it's not going to happen for a long time to come.
Yeah. Uh, so they can, I think, sacrifice that for a certain time period. But the one thing that has changed is for the first time in Ukraine's history, you now have public opinion polls in the last five months showing a majority of Ukrainians want to join NATO. When I was there, it was only 30 percent. Ten years ago, it was only 25 percent. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the achievements. You know, when your country gets invaded by a neighbor, people look for a way protection. to protect that protection. Yeah, Constanza, yeah. yeah. you hear? And that is also the motivation behind NATO enlargement. It wasn't an encirclement strategy by the West. We were offering NATO membership to the Russians at one point. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many Western politicians have spent so much time trying yeah. to come to an accommodation, strategic, military, political, economic, with Russia. I mean, really, I, I just this is a narrative that I don't buy. But I don't, what I find completely unacceptable is the notion of us promising to anybody that we will never take Ukraine uh, into the EU or NATO. That is for Ukraine to decide. What, we, what, I, what I can imagine is saying, listen, this is not on the table. We will never take it off the table, but it's currently not on the table because as everybody can see who isn't completely blind, we have some other problems to deal with here. And, um, but but what, I want, what, what I want to emphasize, and again, speaking as a German, is, is that, you know, I... I don't like these sort of deterministic re readings of a country. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, I have a good reason personally to say that. Uh, the notion that Ukraine can never change is, I think, simply wrong, because that has been applied to Turkey, to Poland, to the Baltic countries, to Spain, where I finished school uh, right after Franco's death, uh, and w which went through a monumental transformation. And of course, it has also been applied to my country. So I think, you know what, countries change. That is part of the experience of the 20th century, and it's the greatest gift we got in 1989. And let's not just throw that away. And I would say, because... Yeah. But there is one thing which is much more uh, imminent than uh, the strategies we are discussing now, and that is what do we do with the border? We need to have a sealed yeah. border before yeah. we do anything Absolutely. else. And nothing is going uh, anywhere there. You've got just two days ago the, the reaction of uh, the Russian side to the decision by the Ukrainian government to ask the UN for very legitimate blue helmets uh, to, to guard the border. Look at the attitude to the OSCE, which is in good faith there. So I think we have much more imminent problems to look yeah. at uh, before we ever start looking at strategies of that long, uh, yeah. I, I think they're not even midterm, they're long-term nature. I just wanted to finish your thought, Costanza, and if you think about Germany and Japan in 1945 and where they are now, if we had given up on you, if we had consigned you to some ghetto of authoritarianism, you wouldn't be the democracies you are today. It's a great example of redemption, and Americans certainly believe in redemption. Yes. I think, Jim, do we have a, a question from? It yeah. took several decades, OK? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it took about 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nathan Rockward in Belfast asks, how has China's experience, this is your chance, right. with the Russian economic model shaped its economic policy today? Well, you know, we. Does it work? It yes. works, yeah. Well, we had a very bad experience with a planned economy. We, <laughs> we, in Chinese history, we never had a plan. So suddenly we're given five years. We don't even know the logic why five years. Um, so it, it is a disaster. There's no question. But don't forget, there is also uh, the other side of the story, which is the 50s when the Russians actually sent aid in a project, which is a very big project to China to build infrastructure even though end up a very bad relationship. Russia and the Eastern Europeans actually contribute the initial uh, jumpstart experience for our basic infrastructure for industrial manufacturing industry. So I think uh, it'd be fair to say. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a question in the back, yep. Uh, Charles Kogan, uh, Kennedy School. This is a question for Costanza, thank you for your very heartfelt speech. A few years ago, the former ambassador to Germany, John Kornblum, said to me in an interview, and I quote, Germany is out of the danger business. Uh, obviously, Germany is the only country in Europe that can stand up to the Russians militarily. Do you think it is possible that the German population can be wrenched out of its pacifism and develop an aspiration to become a major military power again? Thank you, Chuck, for that yeah. easy question. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Russia would love that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, look. Another reason. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, um, oh God, you know, I often, I was thinking earlier when Lin Chen Chang was, was talking about the Chinese sudden affection for the, for the EU, because we're also post-Westphalian. I, I think sometimes we get loved for the wrong reasons. Um, well, on Germany, I have to tell you, I know John Kornblum. I've known him for years, OK? And I often get into fights with him. And I, and I think that, that you know, the, whole, the whole German pacifism thing is, is one of these motifs that, frankly, is a little out of date, OK? Um, the, as I was saying earlier, uh, German troops have been in fairly sustained combat uh, missions in Afghanistan for what three four years now. Yeah, took us a long time to get there, but they are there. We're, we were arming the Peshmerga in yeah. Iraq. I mean, when I heard that, I thought you know I had been hit on the head by a brick. Um, we are currently, and I think this is even more significant. Um, about half a year ago, the Germans came up, you know, in preparatory to the Wales summit with this uh, framework nation concept. The NATO summit. Uh, but yes, the Wales NATO summit, which essentially says Germany, uh, it's premised on the, on the understanding that we may not have an American back, backbone in Europe when things get serious. Not because the Americans have pulled out of Europe or don't like us anymore, but because they'll be preoccupied elsewhere and we have to deal with our own, okay? Which I think is fine. But so the German concept here is, okay, then we'll provide it. We can't provide it for all of Europe, but we can provide it for some of our neighbors. And this has gone so far that the Dutch, for example, and a couple others are actually putting their troops under German command. I cannot tell you, and they've already done this, I cannot tell you how revolutionary this is, particularly for the Dutch, who have some very bad historical memories of the Germans <laughs> invading them. Now, but, but what's even more revolutionary about the framework nation concept is this. It means we can no longer say no. If you are the framework nation, if you're the backbone, oh. you don't get to say no. Something happens, you got to be there. Yeah. And that, by German standards, is huge. Um, is it enough? No, but that would be an entire different conference. A completely new conference, happy to do that, but I think you're doing Africa next year. <laughs> <laughs> Fyodor, you want to follow up? No, I, I dare to say a couple of words only because uh, I'm now spending a couple of weeks in Berlin at, at the Bosch, Bosch Foundation. And I'm very grateful because it's really extremely important to understand how Germany is changing. And, and I'm, I'm absolutely sure that Germany is changing. Germany is not changing towards uh, becoming uh, uh, or coming back to this militant past, of course. And uh, I think that the, the very fact that such question emerges, the, whether Germans and Russians can fight each other again, that, that, that's a terrible. That, that's mm -hmm. really a disaster of all of us, those who, who, who deal with, with, with political, political stuff. But I think that Germany will certainly play a completely uh, different role, both in Europe and in the world. And I, would, uh, I, I will say tomorrow in my introduction, and I'm very grateful uh, to a Chinese colleague that he mentioned that, that there is uh, Ostpolitik of Germany now is not about Russia. It's about, about most, more about China. And that will have profound impact on everything, including Russia and Eurasian space. And uh, so I don't think it's, 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 uh, in, uh, it's, it's relevant to discuss whether the German army will be ready to stand up to fight somebody. But there's completely different uh, means. And uh, uh, John Kornblum, for example, whom I know very well uh, as, uh, as well, and he, he, he is uh, author of very interesting concept of Germany as networking superpower, which will or reorganize the, the whole Eurasia. Very interesting concept, yeah. mm, strange one. But what, what, I, <laughs> what, what I would like to, to, to say, uh, which I think it's important for our discussion, whatever we think about Ukrainian, Ukrainian conflict, in global uh, scale, it's a periphery. It's a peri peripheral conflict. And the vast majority of the world simply does not interest it in that. Look at China. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we, I'm tempted to debate, but we're going to go on to other questions <laughs> right here. Richard Anderson, Rockport, Maine. And a uh, career diplomat and uh, former Russian ambassador Jack Matlock uh, professes that uh, contends that what is missing today is private diplomacy. And he refers back to the Gorbachev-Reagan 
era and that kind of diplomacy where deals were struck much behind the scene and no, and today it's all public diplomacy that's going on, name calming, uh, redlining, and so on and so on. Is that, that seems like a very simplistic view to me on Sorry. one hand, but on the other hand, what's, is that missing today? Is there private diplomacy going on? Is that what's, is that what is needed? Well, uh, I would, I, Steve and I especially, as juniors to Ambassador Matlock, who's a great American diplomat, would never say he's simplistic. He's a very sophisticated guy. But, you know, you don't really need that backroom negotiator, the secret envoy, if your heads of government are dealing with each other. Exactly. Angela Merkel, Angela Merkel. Yes, I'm, but I'm just, a, just about to say, I think that my impression is that Chancellor Merkel and President Putin have talked hundreds of times. And there's been no lack of communication between the American and Russian governments every day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need the secret on like, boy mm -hmm. when you don't have a relationship. We have relationships, they're just yep. not working, Steve. Well, well, yeah, I'd make two points. You know, one is uh, if you look at how often Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Lavrov meet, I mean. Several the, times a yep. week they yep. talk. There's a lot of opportunities there for those private conversations. Now, I'm not sure that Foreign Minister Lavrov has much authority in those things. I think he's basically got a fairly set uh, talking points. But there would be that channel at a very senior level for the conversation. The second point, though, I, I mean, I think it's, it's not a secret that the personal chemistry between Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin is not particularly good. Uh, back in, I think it was about a year and a half, two years ago, President Obama got some criticism when he made reference to Vladimir Putin sort of sitting there like a lazy boy in school and things like that. And I actually defended the president on that one because Vladimir Putin does things by calculation. Mr. Putin was sitting that, in that very lazy schoolboy stance to convey, I think, a measure of, di of contempt to the president. And it was, I think, a proper thing then for the president to call him out on that. Um, but I go back to the summer of 2013, where there was, they were building towards a bilateral summit. The president was going to go to Moscow before going to, uh, I think it was the G20 in St. Petersburg. Yeah. yeah. And basically, uh, in August, about a month before, they, they canceled the summit. They said the president's not going. And the press basically said, and this is because of the uh, Snowden affair, the press got it wrong. It was because they said on the big issues, on nuclear reductions, on missile defense, on trying to build a more dynamic business and economic relationship, they said, the Russians are giving us nothing. I mean, there's no, going to Moscow would have been, I think, a political risk for the president. He would have been criticized by people, such as Senator McCain, which he's mentioned a couple times already today. Um, but I think he would have prepared to take that if he'd come back and say, we got something. But, you know, there was nothing there. So there's, I think there is a channel. At the highest level, the channel hasn't worked, but for that channel to work, there's also got to be some prospect that it's going to produce something. And I think at this point, the White House has concluded that right now there are no signals that that kind of engagement is likely to produce anything. And that Chancellor Merkel has the better chemistry, the better relationship, and, and she ought to be the uh, prime interlocutor with Putin. I think we have a question coming in from, from either Belfast or Rockland. It's from, it's from Louis Sell. From Camden. Louis Sell is a former American diplomat who's a great expert on Russia, is, is writing a great book about the end of the Soviet period. Russia and China and Central Asia, is there co com competition for influence? And if so, who's likely to win? This is for the two of you to say. <laughs> well, of course there's competition. But uh, I think the West, West exaggerated the last few years saying the great new great game, which is does not realize. Um, so I think, yes, competitions are always there. The, you know, the Eurasian Union is essentially uh, anti-China. Chinese knew that, thanks to the Ukraine <laughs> case, that project is gone. So therefore, <laughs> Chinese understand that perfectly. So yes, we are winning in that sense. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Sorry. Right of reply. I, I can congratulate because Central Asia is a really valuable trophy, especially <laughs> some countries. But in fact, I think in the end it will be some kind of some kind of com combined work because China. It's not a great game for sure. China thinks in different categories, uh, and uh, Chinese economic influence. Uh, and Russian political influence are a little bit in different dimensions. So we don't compete directly. 
Okay, I'm glad that you're still friends. This is good. Um, <laughs> we're supposed to end. Would people like to stay five more minutes? Yes. Okay, we have a question here and then a question in the balcony, right here. I'm Virginia Emanuel from the Bangor area. Uh, this is for Professor Jean. Um, I, I was fascinated by your comments about the China-Russia relationship and how it's stronger and growing stronger. And also your comments about how China doesn't know how to work with the West or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Would you tease that out a little bit more and explain why China doesn't know how to work for the West, with the West? Well, I mean, China is uh, presumably the, one of the longest civilizations in the world, but it's shortest in, in its experience dealing with uh, world uh, international diplomacy. You know, Westphalian system was forced upon China in 1840s. Don't forget that. Uh, so th there is a long process of learning how they don't like it from the very beginning. They want to resist it. Then they were, they were defeated again, 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 uh, until communists took over. Finally, you know, we had some autonomy. So, the, you know, the, then we are learning how to use the existing international rules of the game dealing with West. This is where I'm talking about. What Russia is different. Russia knows everything about diplomacy in, in, in the Western Westphalian system. So here, I think we have a lot of experience. Uh, we, you know, we need a lot of things uh, we, we need to learn. I, if you want me more specific, I'll give you one example. It's the monetary system. Uh, Chinese uh, monetary authority is so stupid. A few years ago, they stick to American dollar assets without knowing this is uh, something actually has a political economy behind international monetary system. <laughs> they don't understand the United States' capability of manipulating exchange rates. Uh, through its federal you know, re uh, reserve policy. So these are things they had only learned during the current crisis. <laughs> 2008, they finally realized where David Kaleo has been teaching us that subject for many years. Very good. Uh, <laughs> point here. Uh, I mean, there is one way in which China's activities in Europe have been very interesting, and that is that China has been buying up European assets. Yes. Yeah? Uh, the, the, the foiled uh, attempt to buy the uh, harbor of Piraeus is, is one of the very rare cases where that has been unsuccessful. Uh, but in many cases, uh, the Chinese have moved in with labor, with investment, and with buying businesses outright. Right. And they are now a major factor, particularly in the crisis belt of Europe and the South, right. you know, from, from Portugal to, to Bulgaria. And, right. and that is a way in which, I mean, I, I, I find this fascinating because it's, it's not entirely clear to me yet what the, you know, the calculation behind that is. But what that means is that you know, our problems are going to be your problems. Good. And. Um, <laughs> I look forward. You I see, look forward to those conversations. I, 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 you see, I am the leading <laughs> critique of our own central banks uh, in China. I, you know, at, during the crisis, I wrote a number of articles attacking our central banker because they are all trained by Chicago. Why you live in Geneva? No, they, no, they're, trained, <laughs> they're all trained by Chicago school. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh God, 100%. Chicago is always the culprit. Isn't Terrible. It? So we have a final question, and maybe I ask the panelists. Well, brief comments to the final one, but everyone will have an opportunity, whatever this question is. Arthur Fass, Colby College. Uh, considering the fact that Ukraine is having a big problem with corruption, are there mechanisms in place to ensure that the presently given monetary aid is used, being used appropriately? Another question, quick question. Uh, there's arguments to be made that the modern Ukrainian identity has a very weak foundation. Uh, it's a diverse country. There are Russian speakers, Ukrainian speakers, the Hungarians, the Poles. And um, has the conflict um, helped the Ukrainian authorities to uh, strengthen the sense of uh, national unity? Or is a collapse and disintegration of Ukraine more likely because of the conflict? Thank you. So maybe I'll suggest um, Elena, Fyodor, the first question um, on uh, you know, the Ukraine's issue with corruption. Then we'll go to the second question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I did mention uh, in my first uh, intervention um, the importance of rule of law, and to be honest, I was surprised that uh, it was not explicitly addressed uh, since yesterday. Um, I believe that uh, 
something which my country uh, really uh, benefited a lot from. Uh, I believe that uh, technical assistance uh, to a country, including building up institutions, uh, checks and balances, transparency um, of, of the process, of the bureaucratic the administrative process in the country, that is, that is crucial. I, we cannot move any forward within the domestic development of either of us, the new new democracies, the new members of the European Union, unless we start that path. It's not easy, it won't happen overnight, but that's the only way to save our nations from a totally um, um, kind of a disintegrated state uh, uh, of the society. Um, I would also like to argue, because I may not have the chance afterwards, the, the argue um, about the importance of the transatlantic uh, link, and not NATO. I understand NATO can be sensitive, uh, and I'm ready to hear all arguments uh, about how cautious we should be when it comes to Ukraine and NATO. And then in Bucharest, I agree, Nick, it was so cemented that it's hard to, uh, to, to change from there. But, but um, we have to make sure that the uh, transatlantic trade relationship um, develops uninterrupted. <coughs> Unfortunately, and I'm again talking from experience in my own country, there are attempts uh, to disrupt the negotiation process. Um, and again, um, this is because Russia fears that if that agreement is signed uh, and put into action, in, in, into effect, that would immediately um, isolate in a way uh, trade with Russia or make it less advantageous to Russia. Um, th that can be dealt two ways, either by explaining well what the purposes of TTIP are and uh, making Russia positive, which I don't think is possible right now, or make sure that the two sides to that agreement, Europe and the United States of America, uh, come forward in a more um, um, open way with less um, doubts as to, as to uh, what the, the terms of the agreement would eventually lead to. Um, in one word, um, that should be really an agreement between allies which are, have been and are to, to stay so in a, in, a, in a long future. Thank you. Piotr. So I'm afraid that the Russian position is the smallest problem of TTIP. And there are a lot of others which are yeah. much more important. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't make it clear. In Bulgaria, we have interference. Uh, we have direct interference uh, uh, trying to avert the country from supporting TTIP in Brussels. I thought I would be able to avoid the direct yeah. answer, and, but I'm now... And, and let me just away. point out, um, yeah. what we're talking about sorry. is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Treaty, mm -hmm. the free trade agreement between the EU and the US, which the Obama administration is trying to negotiate. Uh, about Ukraine, I think it's a it's, uh, controversial impact of, of events which, which happened and happens there. Uh, on the one hand, there's of course unprecedented level of national consolidation. External threat, that's, that's quite obvious. At the same time, uh, I think it's a risk that this consolidation will be abused and really destroyed by utterly inefficient, weak and stupid state. And that will have, in this case, the opposite impact at the end. Okay, we're going to have a good discussion tomorrow. Continue all this, but Stephen Costanza, do you now, want to just I think final words? The important words. about Ukraine and, and national identity. I mean, I think first of all, there, there's a challenge for Ukraine, which is, if this conflict in eastern Ukraine ends, that challenge of reconciliation is going to be a long and very difficult one. And I, I would be critical. I think the Ukrainian government could actually be doing some more things now to try to facilitate and prepare for that reconciliation, which is going to have to happen if you bring all of Donetsk and all of Luhansk firmly back into Ukraine. The second point, though, um, and I, I think I agree with Fyodor that, that this is something that the, the government could abuse and it could lose. But I was struck when I was there in September. I had a Ukrainian friend tell me and said, Vladimir Putin has succeeded in realizing the dream of centuries of Ukrainian nationalists. He's formed a national identity. And you, you see it. I mean, you can feel it in the country. And what struck me, in, in, um, when I was there in January, uh, we, went, we traveled by train to Dnipropetrovsk and then to go out to, to the Ukrainian military headquarters for the operation in Donetsk, which is in northwestern Donetsk. We had to go three hours over very rough roads. Uh, but what was interesting to me was you saw the same manifestations of Ukrainian identity, flags everywhere, you know, blue and yellow fences, 
the roads in the countryside painted blue and yellow. Now, this, of course, is the country of Potemkin Village, and that might have been the one road we were meant to see. But I don't, but I don't think so. I, I think there is, outside of, there is a sense of national identity. The last point I make, though, which is worrisome, is that somebody uh, observed in September, I think he's probably right, he said, the national identity that's been forged now has a strong imbuement of anti-Russian feeling. And he said, it's not just anti-Putin. He said, it's actually anti-Russian. And he says, because the Ukrainian people look and they see the Russian people tolerating what their country is doing to Ukraine. And that is not healthy. Uh, that, that, that is worrisome because you're not going to change the geography. Ukraine and Russia are going to be neighbors for a long time to come. Uh, and, and that factor may make, you know, there, ultimately there's going to have to be, I think, some kind of reconciliation uh, between Ukraine and Russia. And that's getting more difficult by the week. Costanza, I'd like to give you the last word of, for today. Um, okay, I think Ukraine is a case where civil society is definitely ahead of its government and its ruling elites. Um, and, but I think we need to respect that. We're no longer in a world where we cannot listen to civil societies. Um, and I think it is pr profoundly meaningful that this is a society that has, at the same time, deep ties with the West cultural, historical, economic, but also very deep ties with Russia. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know Ukraine well, but my understanding is there is no Ukrainian who doesn't also speak Russian, you know, and who doesn't have family somewhere in Russia. And you know, there, the, for this to happen, you know, for, 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 a, for a country like that, that has such an emotional relationship with Russia, to say, you know what, um, not under these circumstances, is, is a, a huge event. And that is why what is happening in Ukraine is a tipping point for the entire security order of Europe in ways that what happened in Moldova, Georgia, or Belarus, the brutal uh, repression of uh, elections in, 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 in Belarus, um, was never going to be. Yeah, this is the big one, make no mistake. Uh -huh. Now, the, behind that, I think, is, is, a, is another issue, of course, and that is that um, none of us can want a situation where Ukrainians never want to talk to Russians again. Yeah? Uh, that would be disastrous, not just for the Ukrainians, but for us as well. We don't want a situation where you have another invisible iron curtain running through Europe just a little farther eastwards. Nobody can want that. We want to have good relations with Russia. But I think it'll, it'll have to be with a Russia whose leaders look a little different, you know, and where people can be free in the same way that Ukrainians want to be free. I mean, that, that I think is my, is my bottom line here. And uh, Professor Shank, I, I do have to take issue with you suggesting you know, that I was being naive and referring to you know, the uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian institutions as legitimately elected. Um, you, know, you may take issue with the Euromaidan, but there have been two elections since then, a presidential and a parliamentary. I do think that those went quite well. Yeah. You had OSCE observers there. Everything went according to the rules. Yep. And so um, I think we have to deal with this, and we're going to have to stick it out. But nothing of what I am saying here, or of what I think any of us are saying here, should be construed as being against Russia forever. That would be the worst possible mistake true. that we could do. Very thank true. You. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank every member of this panel for a rich discussion.